Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 24, I want to invite you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word this morning. Mark 5, beginning with verse 24. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. Whenever you're suffering, what's the one thing that you need most? The woman here in our text, she recognized the one thing she needed most. She needed to touch Jesus. Now there are more ways than one to touch the Lord. Some people only touch Him superficially. He's always drawn a crowd wherever he's truly present. And in that crowd, some people touch him inadvertently. Some people touch him just out of mere curiosity. But Jesus doesn't release his power on the merely curious. However, there is a profoundly personal touch that does contact the healing power of the Lord Jesus. That touch recognizes our personal hopelessness. It it rests everything on His power to make whole that which is broken. See, out of the suffocating crush of the crowd, one desperate woman pushed her way through in order to touch Jesus. At the time, he was on his way to help someone else. If we back up just a little bit to verse 21, we see where he was going. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, an important man, Jairus by name, And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies in the hands, or lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him. So Jesus was on his way to help somebody who was desperately in need. You know, Jesus is always on his way to help somebody. He's always making his way to someone's heart, to someone's house, to someone's door, to someone's uh, sick room. He's always about helping other people. Yet we can stop him with the touch of faith and be healed ourselves. We can come to Jesus today 
with our needs, with our brokenness, with our hopeless situation, and touch Him in a way that brings healing to us. Notice first of all this morning that you can touch Jesus in a hopeless situation. You can touch Him with your perpetual problems, long-standing problems, problems that appear to defy any solution, problems that discourage us by their very duration. This woman had endured 12 years of suffering. She had personal and shameful difficulty. Her loss of blood may have been constant or it may have been intermittent during that time. If it came and went, then her hopes were raised and then dashed. To us, her con condition is both revealed and concealed. See, we can't be for certain what it was other than it was a very shameful threat. It, it wasted away her health. It, it took away what wealth she may have had. And it rendered her socially outcast. She wouldn't have been considered clean to enter the temple. To even worship, she would not be welcome, in other words. And so it was a very shameful, painful condition. An expensive condition. My friend, no matter how long you've suffered in your present spiritual condition, it's never too late to touch Jesus. You can touch Him today. He can and will make you spiritually whole. Even if you feel as though you've been astray for too long. Even if you feel as though there is no hope. We can touch Him with our perpetual problems. We can touch Him with our painful problems. Verse 26 says that, that, that she had suffered many things from many physicians and had spent all that she had to get better, but she wasn't any better and only had gotten worse. She had suffered even from those who were supposed to be helping her. The physicians themselves. She suffered physically. She suffered economically. She had spent everything she had trying to find help. Now some of us know what it's like to to try everything available for spiritual and emotional relief without finding anything. Turning to substance abuse, turning to, to other sin, things that just do not satisfy. Many people try it all without any help. Our problem is that we look for answers in things. And we look for answers in other human beings. And the truth is that we'll only find what we look, we're looking for when we turn to Jesus. Amen. We've got to turn to Him. He's the one who created us. He made us and only He can make us whole through a personal relationship with Him. And that comes... By repentance. Not just belief, but repentance. Turning to Him. Turning away from our sin. And until we turn to Him in repentance, we'll never be healed of our spiritual affliction. We can touch Him with our perpetual problems and our painful problems. And we can touch Him with our pointless problems. In all of her trying, this woman wasn't helped at even one point. In fact, things only got worse. Again, verse 26 says that she had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. The very effort of trying to get help tired her, and it complicated her condition. Can you identify with her? Maybe in this physical realm, you can really identify. What about in the spiritual realm? Can you identify with her? Many of us fight long-term battles with stubborn, relentless inclinations and passions and obsessions and 
fears, anxiety, and guilt. We suffer the pain of mental anguish internally while trying to appear okay on the outside. It all seems pointless. And no amount of personal resolve, no amount of counsel from friends, no amount of religious activity will change anything. If you're feeling like that today, then I have good news for you. You can approach and touch Jesus from that very situation. You can be healed. You can touch Him in a hopeless situation. Secondly, you can touch Him with a sufficient, albeit imperfect, faith. Yes, you can touch Him with, with an imperfect faith. Think about it. This is where many people say, but I'm not fit to touch Jesus. The only fitness required of us is that we recognize our need to touch Him. It doesn't matter what sin you're living with. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Jesus loves you in spite of your sin. He loves you. And He wants you to come just the way you are and let Him change you from the inside out. It's so frustrating when people say, but I've got to make some changes first. I've got to change the way I'm doing some things before I come to Jesus, before I give Him my heart. Come as you are, let Him do the changing, and He'll change you from the inside out. Notice that this woman's faith was imperfect. It was imperfect because it was silent and it was superstitious. See, she thought that she could sneak up on Jesus. She could come up from behind Him in a crowd and He'd never know that she had stolen some healing from Him. She would just touch His garment. And that's how she thought superstitiously, that somehow the power to heal that came from Jesus was somehow charged in through His, his garment. But we know that faith must confess Jesus. But Jesus did honor her faith. He honored her faith because she had Faith. Not perfect faith, but faith. You know, we can't wait for some, some great bit of knowledge. We can't wait for more perfect understanding, for better theological insight before we come to Jesus. The best faith is imperfect faith. You see, it's not perfect faith. But it's the perfect, perfect object of our faith that matters. Jesus Christ. That's what makes us whole. Think about little children. Remember Jesus said, let the little children come unto me, don't hinder them. Remember Jesus said that if, that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, become as a little child. Children. You know, people ask me, and we discussed this Wednesday night in some depth in um, our Bible study time, but what is the age of accountability? Is there such a thing as an age of accountability? Yes, indeed, I believe there is an age of accountability. What is it? I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's different for each person. God only knows. It's different for each person. But there comes a point in our lives when we understand that we are sinners and we need Jesus. We understand right from wrong and living for Him and how that is more desired by God. That we give up our sinful, selfish ways. And for some, it's much younger than others. But think about it. I've heard, I've heard the argument, well, we shouldn't let children who, who are not very old, who don't have a lot of knowledge, who don't have a lot of training, we shouldn't let them be baptized because they're just, they're just doing it because they saw a friend do it or they just, they're just wanting to get wet. Well, you know what? 
This woman didn't know it all. She didn't have perfect knowledge. She didn't have great theological insight. She was superstitious. She was selfish, sneaking up on Jesus the way she did. But Jesus honored her faith because she had faith. Faith grows. None of us have reached it yet. None of us have reached perfection. That's why we're still here. When we reach perfection, we'll be with Him. When we reach perfect understanding, we'll be with Him. We're here for a reason. And part of that is to learn as well as to serve. And so, yeah, I, I think little children need to be given the opportunity to express their faith. According to George Barna, there's another reason we should allow children to come to Jesus. Aside from the command of Jesus to let them come to Him. But think about this. Children between the ages of 5 and 13 have a less than 30% chance they'll ever accept Jesus Christ. After age 13, that probability drops to less than 5%. And less than 50% of the world's population will accept Jesus. That's why ministry to children and youth is so vital for the church. That's why it's so important that we reach out to them. That we share with them Jesus. Not just to entertain them. Not just to make them want to be here. Not just to make them happy and to please them. But to teach them about Jesus and help them come to a relationship with Him so they'll grow up to be adults who know Him and serve Him. Yes, you can touch Jesus with an imperfect faith. And notice that an imperfect faith, an imperfect but sufficient faith, is rewarded. It's rewarded in fact. Verse 29 says that immediately... The fountain of her blood was dried up. Immediately, this woman was healed. As soon as she touched him, the blood stopped on the spot. She was healed. That's a fact. Not only was her faith rewarded in fact, it was rewarded in feeling. The rest of verse 29 says, And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. My friend, not only was she made well, but she knew she was made well. She knew she was healed. She realized inwardly that she was permanently and profoundly healed, not only from the symptoms, but also from the disease that had caused the symptoms. My friend, Jesus not only wants you to be spiritually whole, He wants you to know that you're spiritually whole. He wants you to know that you've been healed. To know that the threatening failure of yesterday will never return. You can touch Him in a hopeless situation. You can touch Him with a sufficient, albeit imperfect, faith. <clears throat> Finally, this morning, notice that Jesus responds to a believing touch. Jesus responds when we reach out in faith. He distinguishes between superficial and meaningful touches. Now scholars have debated over whether this cure that came out from him was voluntary or involuntary on his part. Whether he knew in advance that this woman was going to sneak up and, and, and touch his garment and be healed. And you know it really doesn't matter. But what we do know is that Jesus is so filled, filled with power to make whole that any touch of personal faith in Him will bring about healing. Any touch of faith is rewarded in a powerful and profound way. But we have to understand the difference between superficial and meaningful touches. See, Jesus has always drawn a crowd. 
There's always people around when Jesus is truly present. But simply touching the church building, simply touching the pew, simply touching the Bible or the hymn book, coming to church activities, being a part of the religious traditions, those things are not the same as touching the Lord Jesus Himself. See, it's not about touching the things that are connected to Him, but it's about touching Him personally. We have to touch Him to see the difference, to be made whole. Jesus desires that we confess Him when He makes us whole. Look at verses 30 and following. And Jesus, immediately knowing in Himself that power had gone out of Him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But His disciples said to Him, You see the multitude thrown in you, and you say, Who touched me? And He looked around to see her who had done this thing. See, Jesus looks for a response when He saves us. Jesus doesn't save us through some impersonal religious transaction. We can't mail it in. We can't steal healing from behind His back and then just go on our way without Him. The woman in this passage found that out. Some say, but I'm, I'm afraid to, to stand up in front of a crowd. I, I'm afraid. I'm too, too shy. I'm too nervous. Jesus made it clear that if we fail to confess Him before others, He will not confess us before the Father in heaven. So, that argument doesn't hold water. It's the devil's way of trying to keep us from responding to Jesus. <clears throat> Many people fear a public confession of Christ. You know, our churches are, are full of people today all across America who think they're saved, but they've never confessed Christ publicly. Look what verse 33 says. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This woman had feared to identify herself. This was her natural inclination. It's a natural thing for most people to be shy about standing in front of crowds. If it wasn't, there wouldn't be university classes on how to speak in a public crowd. But notice that Jesus, Jesus didn't ask her to stand up and embarrass herself. Jesus didn't ask her to to air out her dirty laundry. That's not what he's interested in. He simply wanted her to confess that he had healed her. He had touched her. He had healed her of her problem. And that's what he wants for you today. If you're lost today, he doesn't want you to air out all your dirty laundry before the church. He's not interested in you being embarrassed. That's not what he's interested in. What he wants you to be willing to do is stand up and say yes to him and to do so before others. Confess him before others. That's what the Bible makes that clear. Jesus wants us to confess him when he makes us, when he makes us whole. Someone does something to save your life most likely you're going to be proud of that and willing to, to tell other people about it. You want others to know what this person has done for you. Jesus wants not only to save your life, He wants to save you for all eternity. Let others know. Jesus confirms our wholeness. When we confess Him. He confirms our healing. 
that has taken place, this woman's public confession won his confirmation. Look again at verse 34. And he said to her, before these people, they all could hear him say, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Hidden discipleship doesn't get that kind of affirmation. Not only did Jesus give her a confirmation, He gave her something more important. He gave her peace. Someone who had been troubled for many years, for 12 years, with this terrible disease, who had been put to shame, had been in pain, who had been emotionally and, and financially bankrupted. She now had peace, and that peace that, that is spoken of here is a, the Greek equivalent of the familiar Hebrew word shalom. And that word shalom, does, it means more than just peace, it means peace as in wholeness, being made whole again. That's the kind of peace Jesus gave her. He sent her out with total personal well-being. And the good news is, my friend, He'll do the same for you today. He'll give you total personal well-being if you touch Him by faith, if you confess openly His healing. Now, I can't promise you any physical healing. But I can promise you something greater than that. And that is something that's everlasting. Something that's eternal. And that's total spiritual healing. Amen. And that's what you really need. It's what we all really need. It goes beyond the physical. The temporary. Jesus responds to a believing touch. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you're here today because you have need of healing. Maybe you've been struggling for years to find a solution. Or maybe it's just a recent thing that you've even recognized. The affliction. But you need healing. And you haven't been able to find it by any other means. Maybe you've searched far and wide for answers. Maybe you've looked for it in knowledge. Maybe you've looked for it in alcohol, drugs. Maybe you've looked for it in the affirmation of other people. Or some other artificial means. There's only one answer. There's only one way to get the kind of healing that we all need. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ. And He wants to heal you today. But you've got to recognize your need for Him. You've got to admit that you need Him. Admit your, your, your total helplessness without Him. And confess Him. Repenting of your sins. Turning your back on those things that are only temporary. And trusting Him to do the healing. Will you do that today? In a few moments, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you need Jesus today, don't let any excuse keep you from coming to Him. Just step out. Make your way down this aisle and say, I need Jesus. Christian, have you gotten away from where you should be? Have you been looking elsewhere for answers? You need to rededicate your life this morning. Has God led you to this church? Not just to be spiritually fed, but to to serve, to be a, a part of this family of faith? 
You'll find our doors open, our reception warm and loving. You just need someone to pray with you. And you need to kneel at this altar and pray. I want to invite you to come. Heavenly Father, as your Holy Spirit continues to speak to us, we pray now that that you would have your way, that we would be obedient, that we would acknowledge your healing touch through your Son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.